You're watching the Letterman Podcast with Mike Chisholm, endorsed by the Hello Deli. Yeah! <laughs> Welcome once again to the Letterman Podcast. My name is Mike Chisholm. I'm so excited about this episode because it's a member from the community. And and uh, from the very beginning, one of the things we've wanted to do with this show is assemble a community of folks, like-minded folks who enjoy uh, this stuff as much as we do, talking about the different perspectives, the memories, uh, and going through some of this amazing, amazing material put out by David Letterman and company. Now, this member of the community um, is being featured on the show because she's a, t- a TV historian. And and she has a, an incredible perspective because she's a millennial. She's she's a millennial. She's in her early thirties. A gal loves this stuff as much as every uh, diehard fan there is out there. Came to the party differently uh, because she was not even born for a lot of these things that we love so much. And and I just appreciate it. her name is Allison Lips, real name, not a stage name. Allison Lips, and uh, she has gone and um, become a historian about all things television. Um, specialized in certain areas, we get into the stuff that she is she specialized in, and 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 uh, in her research and and things that she's taught. She's taught this stuff at university. It's unbelievable. And she's working gonna gonna get a PhD. She will be Doctor Lips at some point. Uh, very cool talking to her. But she has a soft spot um, in in what she adores for late night. Conan O'Brien was her was her gateway into this thing. Also stories of Johnny Carson from her father. And I just really, she and I have gone back and forth many, many times in the background. And I just thought, you know what? It'd be great to have you on the show because your perspective is so uh, different. The whole thing about this, the Letterman podcast is to have that transfer of knowledge from the different generations. And and we want to be a conduit to transfer the knowledge of what Dave and company did to future generations. Allison is doing that. And uh, I just really appreciate her and her taking time to come and do this and, uh, and and actually put a recorder on to the conversations that we have uh, off uh, off camera uh, quite a bit. And I just appreciate her very, very much. So let's get to it, shall we? The Letterman Podcast, a proud to present TV historian, Allison Lips. Allison, the first question that I have for you, we're going to get into how you got into this, uh, but yeah. but being a historian and academic uh, who has focused on television, the impact, the history. You're a millennial. You're in your early 30s as we record this. You're a woman. I am fascinated to know your perspective on things. Um, you've taught this stuff at a, at, at, a, at a university level. Let's go right there, and then we'll kind of unravel the whole thing from from, from this point. What, what, what have you taught uh, when it comes to television history, um, and do you love doing it? do love doing it. I have taught TV history of the 60s and the 70s. Due to the way that class was formatted, I snuck in a little bit of the 50s and prior to it because my class wasn't a requirement. So you could skip the 50s in order to get into the 60s and 70s, but TV history builds on each other, which is why it is so important to know what came before I got into this because growing up I would listen to my dad tell stories about Johnny yeah which led me to watch the tonight show because I'm like the tonight show is the tonight show so that means I'm gonna watch Jay Leno by the time I was in middle school I started figuring out like okay maybe not for me because I'm a Conan person So when I discover someone, I'm like, I need to find out what their influences are. Right. With Conan led me to Dave, where I'm like, okay, Letterman's still on. I can watch Letterman on Friday nights because school the next day. (laughs) Because you're a middle school student. (laughs) What? I'm sorry. What was that? Because you're because you're a middle school student at this point. As these revelations are kind of popping in your head, you're. You're yes. young. You're 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 13 years old, kind of a thing. Exactly, and I was reading TV Squad, which no longer exists. It was acquired by AOL. Yep. So the Kellers, I believe, was their last name. They had a big influence because I was reading their stuff, and I would even comment occasionally on their posts. But yeah, I was in middle school and started watching what? these shows. What was, Religiously. Your dream, what was your dream job in middle school? I just think this is precious. What was your dream job when you were in middle school? I wanted to be 
a journalist when I, because of the 2000 election, fascinated me. And then uh-huh. there were various times when I'm like, I want to be a stand up comedian. Uh-huh. I want to be a broadcast journalist. I want to be a late night talk show host, which I think every late night fanatic is like, that'd be cool. Yep. Yeah, but there's a particular company you wanted to work for that I happen to know. There you go. (laughs) Some kids want to be a firefighter. You wanted to work for the Nielsen company. Yes, because the Nielsen ratings were my sports scores. So some people stay up and see what the spread was last night Mm -hmm. because they want to see who's going to the Super Bowl. I wanted to know who was in the top 10 in the Nielsen ratings each week (laughs) because... That I found exciting. Obviously, with internet and people watching a million different things, it's less important now. So that's sort of faded because we now measure things differently. Yep. But at that time, that was it. Okay, so you're in middle school. You're, uh, you're, for lack of a better term, a TV nerd. You just, you love this stuff. You yep. go down the rabbit hole. You want to know uh, what's going on behind the curtain on the business side of things. Uh, but also the cultural significance, that kind of thing, leads you to academia where um, you basically, if I have it right, you kind of inhaled as much. Uh, you, you, the journalism was, a, was, was, was perhaps an application where you can have a real, a, a real person job, um, but, but you tried to inhale as much television um, studies that were available in university. Is that a, is that a fair statement? I went to university mostly formed, believe it or not, because I grew up watching TV Land and Nick at Night at a time when they showed old shows, whereas now it's a lot of stuff from the 80s and the 90s. Yep. Even the 2000s, because Nick at Night just shows friends nowadays. Yep. So... It was a lot of finding things on my own. I like to say if it wasn't for the internet, I'd be a completely different person because I was watching clips on YouTube. Um, I think it's what DTV is another fan site with a ton of clips. I, I think I said reading Wikipedia, but reading any news site about TV that I could. Yep. So I was familiar with Bill Carter before (laughs) Because, again, if you're a late night person, the first thing you find out after it's like, okay, the big players are Johnny, David Letterman, Jay Leno, Modern Times, Conan O'Brien. Once you go down that rabbit hole, you're like Steve Allen. And then you're like, okay, but I got to read The Late Shift. Yep. And if you're coming into this now, you have to read The, read the War for Late Night as mm-hmm. well. Well, and and let's get to that part because, uh, you know, and I want to get back to some of the stuff because I am fascinated about you teaching this to people at a university level. I'm I'm, I'm fascinated about that and and where you're going because at some point you're going to be Dr. Lips. Like you're going to get a PhD in this stuff. You're you're right now looking at becoming a PhD. Actually, before we move to 2010, because because that's where we're going to really dive into this, um, you know, and, and, and your formative years were late shift two. That was, that was where one of the things that, 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 uh, uh, you know, strapped a rocket to this passion that you had was your formative years was during late night two. And you paid attention like crazy. I love your perspective on that. We're going to get to that, but I want to talk a little bit about the university side of things, because I think a lot of folks who do have interests in this, myself included, um, struggle with perhaps a, a stigma. I, I don't know maybe if stigma is the right word or not, but but we don't realize that this stuff actually is taken seriously um, in many, many levels. And and you have gotten to explore that side of it. I'm, I'm, I want to talk about, so what university were you at and, and what did you teach um, in the class? Like, I know you talked about all in the family, for example, and you talked about yes. all in the family to a generation that isn't mine or above it's yours and below. And to me, yes. that is a that's that that right there is fascinating. I want to take that and 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 kind of um, uh, I want to talk to you about how late night as a, as a genre uh, is looked mm-hmm. upon differently from the people that you taught versus me, who's you know a generation older than you. So, what university were you at, and how did that happen? Okay, I 
undergrad, I was at Rowan University, which is where I eventually ended up teaching because one of my old professors wanted me to teach his class. Okay, who's that? That was David Biancoli. That was David Biancoli. Okay, and let's do the let's do the background of David for everybody else who might not necessarily know. Uh, the New York Post's version of Bill Carter would that be a, a would that be an apt description or not? Well, he's been with NPR for 20, 30 years or something okay. like that. Okay. So more NPR. Okay. I would argue. No, no, no. But let's 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 really quickly kind of do his resume a little bit there, so people understand who he is. And um, and he has and a Wikipedia article. It's all there for you to read. <laughs> David B. and Cooley, everybody. Check him out on Wikipedia. That's your that's 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 your gateway into this thing. Yes. Okay. So let's talk about that. Oh, what his Wikipedia page? No, we don't need to talk about that. Folks can okay. go up on that. But no, you in the class. I'm I'm super curious. So I had him for TV history one and two. So TV history one is pre sixties. TV yep. history two is sixties and seventies. Um, pre, uh, so TV history one, I had with him and two other professors. That is a class where I would go just for the entertainment because those three were amazing together. Yep. And I would have taken that class as many times as I could. I took TV history two. That was 60s and 70s. My stronger part is the 50s if when it comes to TV. Yep. But obviously teaching 60s and 70s I boned up on that I'm also a game show fan so Adam Nedef is someone who I've been following for a while as well yep. of course that ties into Letterman I was watching the Riddlers on YouTube in high school yep and what's, being a Letterman what's the Riddlers for, for 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 our viewers who might not, yep. not necessarily know what are the what, what's the Riddlers and how's the connection to Letterman it is a game show pilot that David Letterman hosted with, with a bunch of B-list 70s celebrities. So the type of people you would find on Match Game and a few who weren't well known enough to make it to Match Game. Yep. Yeah. And you're watching and, that in high school. Okay. Yeah. Continue. Yes. And... That's not a great show. I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, the light breaks in the middle of the pilot. <laughs> Sounds like a Letterman bit. Does. I also found Looking for Fun, which I know Don took down because someone requested he did, but it was an HBO special. Yeah. Very deadpan, very Letterman. Um, so in college, I became the like the girl who loves like Letterman and late night and just has this vast amount of knowledge among my peers. Yeah. Um, obviously Ben Cooley is like, you're learning, you know, what we're learning in class. Here's your DVDs. Go watch them. Because I was hungry for anything I could. And because I had already known a lot of the TV history that everyone knows, he would give me some of the stuff like the time tunnel. I think it was the time tunnel okay. where it's just some bad sci-fi show. Um, so that rounded out, you know, you need the good and the bad when it comes to TV history. I also started exploring other countries because I'm like, I know enough about the U S I need to learn about Canada, which we've had some conversations about <laughs> Australia the UK, um, Letterman fan, very easy to find Harold Schmidt in Germany, which yep. is unfortunate because I don't speak German. And I'm like, I would love that this guy if I spoke German. I am learning German, but now it's one of those things like I was finding clips of Letterman in the 80s. Now it's finding clips of Harold Schmidt because he retired. So let's talk about Harold for a second, because, I mean, people who are, are, are listening to or watching this show may or may not know who Harold is. And I think that that's a really uh, he's a, he's a very curious, interesting um, uh, footnote when it comes to this stuff. A, a lot of these huge late show 
uh, or late night uh, show, television shows have been par parodied, imitated, whatever you want to call it, carbon copied, uh, the similar formula, the sim right down to some of the most, um, you know, the teeniest details, and then broadcast in their own country as, you know, their presentation. Harold is kind of the herald of that would he not be he's the he's kind of the the, the king of the the king of the heat love harold because one as letterman has said he's the guy in germany who does my show they literally took his late night set and just transported it to germany mm -hmm. then there's also the fact that he has taken bits from conan and letterman and that's why i was laughing because it's such a bizarre thing where you're like, NBC was suing Dave over intellectual property for stupid pet tricks, which they didn't even own. Like, isn't there something in international copyright law where you can't just steal things without paying for them? <laughs> and Harold had a huge run, right? Yeah, he's well known in Germany. I'm not too familiar with German television, but he probably be the equivalent to dave there yeah and and a long time on the air i don't know i, I you know I, I should probably look up the uh to see how many years but yeah it was multiple shows but yes yeah absolutely and then yeah co copied dave and conan and to the point where conan uh conan has done you know various bits over the years where he talks about folks who who who, who imitate him in various countries yes. and how big he is in different countries and and uh uh, you know, so the genesis of that probably is Harold, I would think. I think it's taking it to its logical extreme. <laughs> but um, we also have to remember that late night TV and its American form yep. is a very American format. So if you look at the British talk shows like Graham Norton or even the way James Corden did his, it's everyone comes out and we have a party and get drunk and it's great. So everyone brings their own flavor to the talk show. But because American, specifically United States media, is mm -hmm. broadcast all over the world, everyone gets and I'm in New Jersey, so everyone gets our stuff. Mm -hmm. Whether it's good, whether it's bad. I mean, people think New Jersey is like Jersey Shore, and I'm like, seaside's my local, one of my local beaches. No, we don't like those people. Those people ruin it for everyone else. So television has a huge impact in how people see us, and I think late night television is one of those things where you get to see all of those stars in a different light. Mm -hmm. It's uh, yeah. And, and, and it's, has it always been that way? Like when you go back and you think of, 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 of Johnny and Johnny's earlier shows, like to me, my version of, of big time show business is different than my father's. Like I look at, I look at, at, at Johnny Carson and I, I always use the example of guys like Frank Sinatra and, and, and the biggest stars of the day at that point who would, who would come on. And it was almost like a celebration of, 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 yes of of the unattainable of uh you know because the internet wasn't there it was a very different time and place would that be used as a vehicle for folks to you know get a message out there change their image whatever that is back then as well as the way that it, it is it the same device has it always been the same device or has that evolved over the years I think it's always been where people come and onto a talk show and show you a side they want to see you, whether it's participating in a sketch like Betty White and Johnny Carson Tarzan or talking about something they wouldn't otherwise like Hugh Grant on Jay Leno, where Jay famously asked him, like, what the hell were you thinking? Right. So it's always been a platform for celebrities to go and tell us whatever they want us to know, whether mm -hmm. it's a different side of them or just maintaining that Im image, because especially with Steve Allen and Jack Parr, those were at a time when like, yeah, you had the gossip rags, but everyone had carefully manicured images that they projected to everyone else so that 
people wouldn't think about like yeah like they go home and take a bath like everyone else does mm -hmm. but they don't want you thinking about that whereas now especially with social media where like everyone's everyone's more or less the same when it comes down to it but there are people who are living more extravagant lifestyles or different jobs but there's no illusion of oh they're like so different from me and glamorous when you can wake up and take a selfie without makeup <laughs> right I want to talk more about the evolution of, of, of the talk show. I want to get into that. Uh, let's go back to the class for one second here uh, because the fast, <clears throat> the generation gap is fascinating to me. Part of the reason that I'm called to be, want to call it that uh, to do this is the transfer of knowledge. It's to take the genius stuff that Dave and company did. And, and no and, off position in the genius switch. There you go. There you go. And, and, and show it to, you know, generations that are coming. And I've talked about this on the show, you know, the genesis of that was, you know, my daughter-in-law just, you know, sweet little blonde 24 year old, uh, you know, shows me this piece of comedy and, 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 mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not going to say who it's from, but it's like, a direct, you're leaving us some, hanging no uh, well i just don't want to you know some would call it an homage some would call it a blatant ripoff i'm like you don't understand dave did this 20 something years ago let me show you you know i sit her i you know sit her johnny down stole her. from i mean johnny stole from steve allen so it's always been that way and one of the things that bugged steve was that johnny never attributed it to him in a way that letterman would be like yeah this was a Steve Allen bit when it came to like the suit of magnets yep. or, like, or the suit of chips and dip where like Steve Allen was jumping into vats of jello. Yeah. Yeah. He would say this is, uh, I, I guess this is, I think what Dave would say is, I think this was made or not. I think uh, this was made popular on the Steve Allen show. Like things like this where he would actually, yeah. he would actually throw that yeah. out there. What are some of the things that, uh, that Johnny perhaps uh, homaged? Fresh being nice, Karnak. There we go. That's yeah. the silver bullet when it comes to that. Karnak the was the question kids. man. Yeah, the question man. There you go. See, and okay, this is the part where I like talking about this because maybe some people who are viewing or listening uh, might now go down a rabbit hole and, and figure some of this out. That's that transfer of knowledge right now. I'm so curious. You're a gal in your early 30s. And you're talking about stuff that my dad's dad watched. And that is fascinating to me. Going back to teaching this stuff, um, the generation right, that has come. Mike, oh, go ahead. Yeah, go, go. In conversations we've had off camera on, on, on the podcast, we've already gone over my interest there. Fountain pens, <laughs> old TV, history, and vintage guitars. So I'm basically a middle-aged man as it is. <laughs> were you that way when you taught all in the family to people that were younger than you that's the that's the one that so 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 you're in david's class you now get the opportunity uh you know to start teaching and and, and doing some of these things um you know and then you go to something like all in the family and you're teaching it to a very different generation with a very different set of values um you and I've talked about this. A lot of folks think that that show doesn't age well. And yet that show was, it was one of the, it was, it was a cultural phenomenon when it came out and, 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 and uh, even after it had gone off the air, people still talk about it. I'm talking about it with reverence right now. There's a reason that you talked about it in your class. Uh, I want right. to move that over to late night as well, but let's talk about that for a second here. What was it like teaching that? What were people shocked by the content, the the language, uh, what was considered a joke at that time, um, were people? What did people think of Norman Lear and that project? I actually had to write an essay about that. So that was one of those that we took, let them go home and watch, and some of them watched it with their parents, who obviously were aware of that show. They were surprised. One of them even said, like, I'm my mom was surprised you're allowed to show it. And it's like, it's history. It's the 60s and 70s. I can show whatever I want as long as it's relevant. I mean, I snuck in David Letterman on Johnny Carson just because, you know, 
what else am I going to do? You invited <laughs> yeah. me on this podcast. Like, yep. Of course that was going to happen. Yeah. You, yeah, you wanted, <clears throat> you snuck in some of the stuff that you loved. Uh, so people were actually shocked that you were allowed to see it. Was there, was there outrage? Was there like, because if we see this, you know, this, this culture that exists now that wants to kind of erase uh, things that have happened and, and, mm -hmm. and, and I don't, I'm not certain. I just came back from France recently and I, and I, and I, I saw, you know, they got a lot of statues and a lot of paintings and a lot of things that are up that I think if they were available for American consumption, uh, there's a, a growing number of people who would want them destroyed or erased or whatever. Whereas the French just put a plaque beside it and said exactly what yeah. it was depicting. And they let culture kind of judge, um, you know, if that was deplorable or not. Uh, w w did you see any of that? think media students are different from the general population because we do study history in depth, whether it's history in general or just TV history and have seen the evolution because we also have to talk about Amos and Andy, which... A lot of people are like, that's super racist, which it is, but it was also the only show on television for years that had a black cast. Mm -hmm. So at that time, there was and there was friction between representation and good representation. Right. And at the time, any representation was considered good rep representation if you're there now we're like oh could we do something better but we obviously don't have a time machine right well and 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 these these uh these growths that happen you know grow i've got a granddaughter right now and she's six years old and she gets growing pains and it's awful because you know she's just in in agony um, and, and it's just literally her body is just stretching and growing. And that's, 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 that's what it is. And I think that culturally we are, uh, we're in a place where we're taking note of some of those growing pains of the past though, not necessarily of where we're at right now, perhaps and it's fascinating to me. I had a, uh, I had a person, um, in my life who was, uh, I guess I could describe them as an activist. And they were talking about the original Star Trek series and they were talking about how sexist it is and all of these things. And I said, I looked at them and I said, are you, are you kidding me? I said, Kirk kissed Yara. a woman, a black woman on screen. Yeah. She was wearing a miniskirt. Don't you understand those miniskirts were a middle finger to what they, these people were being told how they could dress. It was, a, it was a liberation thing. It wasn't also, Lucille Ball was responsible for Star Trek. There you go. Because it's a Desi Lu production. Mm -hmm. There you go. You know, you think about that and, 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 and how rare is it that a woman has that much power in, 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 in the, uh, the forward facing arts at that time. And, and I mean, there's yeah. so, it, you think about that, just the lens of how you view things. And it's fascinating to me. Let's finally move it over. What was the impact of David Letterman in the talk show world when it comes to history? How did he, we, so many times people say, oh, Dave changed the game. He deconstructed the talk show and recreated it. Um, you are somebody who has, you know, at the very least an expert level of opinion on that particular subject. And I'm fascinated to hear your, your standpoint on it. I don't think he necessarily changed. He definitely changed the game, but I don't think in the way people tend to state it. He is probably the most cynical talk show host up to that point. However, a lot of his stuff comes from Steve Allen, which unfortunately we don't have much of his show. But what we do know about it is he was killing an hour and a half of time. So he was doing whatever he could to kill time, which at the time it's like, hey, it's cool you're watching on TV and we're able to do that. Whereas Dave was doing it to subvert the genre because it's like, we could do much better things, but we're just gonna have a monkey, strap a camera to a monkey because we can, which is subversive in the 80s, but in the 50s, something like that. Like the Today Show had, um, 
what uh, uh, J. Fred Muggs, okay. I think was his name. Okay. Who was a monkey, a chimp, a gorilla. No, he wasn't a gorilla. I think he was a chimp. Who was David... Um, Uh, oh my god what am I well, I'm blanking out on his name <laughs> okay but the first host of the today show had a chimp David Garvey no okay you keep going yeah. I'll find that I'll find that yeah. you keep keep going but he had a chimpanzee as his sidekick so <laughs> yeah and we're, like the today show what so there's always been weird things going on at the beginning of TV it was to be expected experimental uh with the with david letterman on late night it was because look what we can get away with at this hour right so what used to be just throwing anything at the wall to see what sticks became uh we're throwing everything out the wall because we just don't care <laughs> so it was an attitude Which, yes obviously um, they cared a lot if you read anything about dave it's like oh yeah if that show was not perfect but the way it looks which is why it appealed to college students and even when i was in college people were still discovering him whether it was through me or not because i can talk to friends and they're like yeah i've seen some of his 80s stuff i didn't share them give them a clip mm -hmm. okay cool like let's talk um, by the way, it is shocking to me that you, in your early 30s, can't immediately pull David Garraway, the very first Today Show host, out of your out of your head that quickly. Oh my gosh! Uh, like, like, like the fact that you even know that is just astounding to me. Um, the impact that Dave made uh, on television. What do you think David Letterman's greatest uh, impact that he has made, or how did he evolve? What's the greatest evolution, or is it is it so vast that you can't? Because I, mean, I mean, Dave had so many phases in his career and 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 what the right. show was. Um, early on, what do you think was his uh, was the mark that he made that uh, that changed everything? That he was subverting the traditional talk show format. He, he may have been using old elements, but it was at a time when they weren't necessary because. Johnny could do these skits with people, so you don't need to throw things off a five-story building. <laughs> and it it's sort of like the early MTV attitude towards talk show. Yeah. So I think that was his biggest contribution because everyone who came after him was influenced by him in some way. Conan has talked about how he was given a list of things to be like, or he, no, he wasn't given a list of things, but they created a list of things because he didn't want to be a Letterman clone. Yeah. So they went sillier and wackier, whereas Dave could be silly, but it was always with a detachment. Yes. Whereas Conan is all in. Yeah, well, and this here's where we go back to the broadcaster background versus the writer background, and of course, Dave is a is a phenomenal writer as well, and and yes. and I think a lot of the time uh, that has been kind of swept under the rug, where I think I, I've heard of I've heard of times where you know the Emmy nods are coming, and and of course, Late Show is 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 being recognized. And and the idea of Dave not being included as one of the writers, being, it's like no, no no of course Dave is a writer like he's a writer yes. as well so I, I don't want to I don't want to diminish that but Conan is a straight up writer Dave is a, Dave's a broadcaster um, right that that Conan, went down this path Conan was unknown when he took over late night he was a writer on Saturday Night Live people knew him from some iconic Simpsons episode and people were like who is this guy when he got late night yeah Letterman people knew because he had already guest hosted the tonight show and we don't really have guest hosts nowadays i think the closest is whatever the daily show is doing on a weekly basis well kimmel does it that's the thing one of the things i love about kimmel right now is 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 he's kind of in that phase of his career where he doesn't 
he gives zero Fs now. He, he's 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 kind of at that place where you know he takes the summer off and and he and he brings folks in. I I I love I love he so he he does um the guest host thing and it's it's interesting guest hosts. It's not necessarily aspiring uh talk show hosts or, or up and coming comedians and things like that it's flat out you know dave grohl hosted uh the halloween episode a couple of years ago or, or oh, yeah some of other, that is you know, right he'll 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 bring in um you know celebrities who want to who want to give it a try um which really i don't think is something that was done other than when dave was off the, the you know the late show did have and this is something I want to do an episode on um, uh, multiple episodes. Cause I want to have some of the people who actually, you know, my aspirations are to have Tom green on here to talk about when he actually got to host late show. I mean, that's a, that's, you know um, I'm going to leave Bill Cosby on the shelf. I'm not going to necessarily go for that one, but um, you know, that's something that I think is very, very interesting. Um, what talk shows also, I've seen Bill Cosby speak. You're not missing much. <laughs> Did you see him speak at Rowan? Yes. Yeah. What was the, it was a, it was a lecture. It was a Martin Luther King Jr. Day breakfast and it was a lecture and he was very angry about a lot of things and not necessarily in a way you would expect him to be. Yeah. I don't know how much you followed him. And obviously as a white woman, I can't really comment on it. But he's very much a pick yourself up by the bootstraps kind of guy. Yep. That that's where I'm comfortable leaving it. <laughs> Was it funny at all? No. Were people upset about that? I don't think so. I mean, he did <laughs> autograph some books, but you had to like pay for the book through the Barnes and Noble, and yeah. Right, right, right. He had he had a he had a thing set up. Um, yeah, but anyway, yeah, guest hosts in, in, in these talk shows, um, was Johnny the first to do that? I mean, Jack Parr sort of did when he walked off, I suppose, but, uh, was Johnny the first to have guest hosts? Johnny is the first, as far as I know, I do know that Broadway open house going even before the tonight show had jerry lester and maury amsterdam mm -hmm. rotating between the two mm -hmm. and then i'm blanking on when it happened but the tonight show there was a period of time where there was a rotating host i'm not sure if it was between steve allen and jack parr or jack parr and johnny carson right where it was like groucho marx and a bunch of other people who would like host a week yeah uh, I, I enjoyed when um, I, I was very saddened when Craig Ferguson left. Craig, I'm a huge, huge uh, uh, admirer of Craig Ferguson, but they they did that for a while. They had uh, when the late late show was retooling and changing around. They had people who were coming in and 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 uh, hosting that. But that was when Craig was gone. I believe. I believe that's how it went. Yes, so and amazing. now we don't even have a late late show. It's now after midnight or at. Yeah, it's after midnight. It yeah, was have you, at midnight on Comedy Central. Have you watched very many of those? When we had Carter on here, I, I, I talked to him a little bit about it. Uh, it was very, very new at that point. Have you watched uh, the the offering that Taylor is doing? No, I, I, it's one of those things, and we've talked about it. I love late night as a genre. Yeah. I think it is losing relevance. Mm -hmm. I don't watch it religiously, obviously. I watched Conan on The Tonight Show. I watched it yesterday because I don't stay up that late. And that was a huge deal. Yeah. But I don't stay up and watch late night religiously anymore. I find it more interesting from a historical perspective. I am one of those people who, if something's big, I'll watch it on YouTube the next day. Yep. Um. There's only so many hours in the day and I can't watch all. We got four late night talk shows on broadcast TV. We've got after midnight, we've got the daily show. I'm sure there are talk shows on other places last week tonight. Mm 
Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's just too many to keep up with and everything's splintered in a million different ways, which is also something I noticed when I was teaching. You noticed that when you were teaching. Interesting. Let's talk about that a little bit. Like you, cause you yeah. were watching it happen real time at that point. Again, Dave, many people saying that Dave is the catalyst. Well, for I, well that was when I was in. Wait, okay. So I was teaching in 2020. No, 20, not uh, fall 2023, maybe. Okay. About two years ago. Yep. Um, and I was finding that to use an example of something, I first had to find out what a given student's reference points were. Okay. So for one, it was the nanny of all shows where I'm like, okay, I'm right there with you. Others, they only watched anime. And it's like, I'm not an anime person. Yep. So I, like, we need to figure this out. What is something we've all seen? And I think when you say Dave was the catalyst for this, are you talking about when he moved from NBC to CBS and then everyone could get their talk show if they tried hard enough? Or yeah. at least that's how it seems. I, that, I that's mean, now you can get a microphone. It. You can have your own late, talk, like you can have your own late night talk show on YouTube because it's a format. It's not necessarily tied to the time of day. You're preaching to the choir, Allison. You're you're, you're talking to a guy who, who wouldn't have it if it wasn't for 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 this dilution that happened. But I think more where 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 Dave gets that credit is that um, you know, Adam Sandler, when he's sang his last song for Dave before he left, one of the lines in it is you paved the way for every late night show. Both Jimmy's should get on their knees and blow you kisses. Um and that was the, <laughs> that was the that was the line. And 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 I know that Dave uh when his when he's you know, approach with this subject, he rebuffs it just like he rebuffs most compliments that he, he seems to receive. Um, but, but there's a lot of folks out there who were inspired and thought that they could do it. And, 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 and at the end of the day, when you think about the drain that the drain plug that Dave removed, it's, it's the tonight show. I, 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 the, the tonight show was, was a dominant force. It was sure. a dominant force. And, and Dave was the first kind of guy and I understand that the landscape was was changing. Like I understand dilution was happening uh, with the expansion of channels and cables and network cable networks and, and 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 satellite networks and things like that. But nobody had ever ramparted the Tonight Show and was able to fortify their own fortress. And Dave was the guy who did it. He was the guy who who, who made it happen, and that allowed. ABC to go, well, okay, are, are we going to do something other than Nightline? And, 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 um, you know, Dave had his 1230 show on CBS as well. Like, of course, with, with bringing Tom over and, and that stayed and is still there, not as the late, late show anymore, of course, like you mentioned. So, so I think part of it is also that, um, where, where there can be something on other than the Tonight Show. Yes. And I think the entire late shift situation led to that because, Johnny wanted Dave mm -hmm. as his successor. replacement, yep. as his successor. So that gave Dave legitimacy when he moved over. So there were a lot of people who were like, okay, yeah, the, it's the, it, maybe it's just like, you know, it's the Tonight Show by a different name kind of thing. Because mm -hmm. Dave did kind of lose some of those edges sand others down and became the host that 1135 needed not nearly to the point that leno did and i was watching a podcast blocks i don't remember the host with jay leno where he's like yeah i had to become that guy it's a job yeah uh, jay's a very blue collar person and he looks at it that way which has le which led to the second late shift. Um, so I think that helped Dave get on his feet. And once that happened, 
you're right. Then the floodgates opened and they gave almost anyone with talk show, like Chevy Chase has lasted a few months. Yep. Pat Sajak. I don't know why you gave him a talk show. That was before um, Joan Dave, River. yeah, that was, he was, he was Dave's predecessor, which, uh, which I enjoy by the way, when Dave would make fun of that, that was CBS's, uh, another one of the many attempts that networks would do to, to, to counter Johnny Pat Sajak was considered the golden child at one point, which is just absolutely delightful to think about. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I yeah, I don't know why you, I actually have a Pat Sajak show mug. <laughs> That's yeah. excellent. Oh, that is that is fantastic. <laughs> yes. So I may have Arsenio too. I I inherited these from someone when they retired. So Oh, that is very very cool. I I uh um you talk about, you know, uh this moment. Let's let's we're all over the place but that's okay cuz that's that's kind of what we do here. I want to go back to a moment that you just talked about. Uh in the past six months, we have seen two massive moments in late night as a genre history where we have seen David Letterman come back and guest on Colbert. And we saw just the other night uh, at the time of this recording, Conan O'Brien came back to The Tonight Show. Now, let's go to 2010 for a second here. This is your formative years. Uh, Jason mm -hmm. Zinneman, who wrote Letterman, The Last Giant of Late Night, um, you know, one of the, the things he submitted when he was on this show was that folks who were in their formative years, when either of those late shifts kind of happened, you know, where, uh, whereas I like to say the cement was still wet. Um, they, they, they have um, a bond to this stuff in a different way than other people might. And, and yeah. I, I really enjoyed that because it made me think about my reverence for Carter and the late shift and all of that stuff. And, and, and I mean, I can't, my copy of The Late Shift, my original paperback that I have, pages are falling out of it. I've read it so many times. It was like a, it was like a textbook, uh, a very entertaining okay. one. That was you we, we in 2010. We approach stuff very differently because I've read, <laughs> do you know how many times I've read The Late Shift? Tell me. Once. One time. One time. I highly recommend it, reading it again. It's got some very cool stuff in it. <laughs> well, I know. I read <laughs> But you've but also, also read, a, wanna, yeah, go ahead. I also read the war for late night mm -hmm. as well. And I read those back to back. So that kind of solidified what everything that went down the first time. And I also knew a lot because I had been studying this until since I was in middle school, Yeah, but I didn't read the late shift until I was already in college. Oh, that is so fascinating to me. Uh, so 2010 Conan this is another thing that is so interesting to me. I can remember you talk about this moment where Letterman goes and ascends and changes and becomes the Tonight Show. You know, he 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 does what yes. it takes to have the eleven thirty show, the big show, and and yes. and his version of the big show, which to me is just absolutely amazing because it combines what my dad loved about the Tonight Show with what I love about Letterman and kind of puts it into one uh, beautiful um, you know melting pot. That's what that was to me. Um, and, and, but I had a lot of people in my life who have the same uh, exhibit, the same behaviors when a band that they love watching, you know, uh, live with 50 people in a room and they have this nearly religious experience seeing these live shows and, and they follow them around from small town to small town. And suddenly that band gets big. Suddenly that band is playing arenas. And people don't necessarily uh, all come along for the ride when it comes to that as something gets more popular. Um, right. That happened with Letterman. It happened with Conan as well. While in 2010, Team Coco, you know, emerged and and stretched out its wings and went for a fly. Uh, yeah. You were you were you were a massive massive Conan fan at that point, and you're one of the ones that didn't necessarily enjoy that part of the ride. Right. So for co more context, I, I I was 18 when Conan took over The Tonight Show. So Jay right. Leno stepped down the Friday before my birthday. Conan yep. started the day after my 18th birthday. There we go. Yep. Um, so Conan, it was announced when I was 13, Conan was getting The Tonight Show in five years, which is insane. I in a business where you don't know if you're working tomorrow, I don't know why you would 
sign a five-year contract, but it was the allure of the Tonight Show. And while I fully believe Conan was the reason why everything went down, it is, it's sort of like he was digging a hole and everyone else just pushed him in it. Yeah. Oh, that's an interesting idea. Okay. Yep. Um. So, yeah, I mean, I'm probably never going to be invited on Conan O'Brien needs a fan. But yeah. Uh. So that kind of how I was watching it, where I'm like, first of all, Jay was effectively fired from the Tonight Show. If you already know who your successor is, you know, I've been in positions where it's like your boss has your replacement and they're like, can you train them? <laughs> and it's like, I didn't resign <laughs> like no i'm not training them <laughs> like you're, so it was one of those things where instead jay's like i need to protect these jobs so then he got the the um jay leno show on at 10 o'clock mm -hmm. which was a ridiculous move on nbc's part because yeah. 10 p.m is usually when you watch your Law and Orders, your ERs, those type of shows. No one wants a talk show at that time. Like I'm a talk show fan. I would not want to watch a talk show at 10 a.m. I mean, 10 p.m. And then there is some validity to Jay's ratings were lower than that hurt the NBC News. Mm -hmm local news at 11 and then it hurt conan's ratings more than they already were mm -hmm. conan hosted for less than a year he never mm -hmm. had time to find his footing yeah had he hosted longer he might have won some of us back on the train but instead things went down in such a way that conan became this martyr and idol for so many people in my age group as like how the baby boomers are screwing over millennials and it's like both men involved are boomers like what are you talking about like yes you can argue conan got screwed but you need to acknowledge the fact that he's not gen x he's not a millennial mm -hmm. he's a boomer mm -hmm. <laughs> and well i understand everything conan did and honestly if i was in his position i probably would have made the same move where it's like fine i'm out of here mm -hmm. i'll figure it out later but at the time it's like people who were never conan fans are getting worked up in a frenzy about this and it's like I have a hard time talking to some Conan fans now because they only know him from the podcast. Yeah. Whereas I grew up with late night. I did watch some Conan when he moved to TBS. Yep. Which I enjoyed not as much as late night, but again, when you're watching something in your formative years and I, for me, there's something magical about the 1235 time slot on NBC yep. where like it attracts a certain type of person and I'm the person who likes those hosts. I mean, Seth Meyers has gone in a different direction because he came from Weekend Update. Yep. And he's not a writer like yep. Letterman and Conan are. Well, he is, but he's a different type of writer, I should yep. say. Yep. So he has his desk log, which is different from a monologue. And Conan is a very physical comedian, even when he's doing the monologue. Yeah. So for me, the podcast doesn't do it because I need to see it. And you want to see those watching... gangly limbs doing things. Yeah, I mean, I could live without the string dance, but <laughs> yeah. Um, let's talk about the Okay, so so he comes back to The Tonight Show. And uh, I, I, I want to talk a little bit and compare a little bit about the how, how each franchise welcome back their former standard bearer um because i think that they were done completely differently letterman's return to colbert i think was a stark contrast to how conan was 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 brought back on i was i was actually very angry at the tonight show when i saw how they brought conan back partially probably because if i probably wouldn't have been 
you know, angry that way. Don't get me wrong. I thought it was fantastic. I thought their exchange was amazing. I just wanted more of it. I wanted them to devote the entire show to, to, to Conan the way that, that, that Colbert and company devoted the entire uh, show that night to Dave. Uh, they didn't do that, but you even talk about this gang, like, like Conan was, I thought when Conan came back to the tonight show for me personally, I thought for one of the first times, Oh, he's a giant. Not physically, although physically they did talk about that, and he did make the set of the Tonight Show look small. Um, he did, yes, yeah. I, so, so there's the physical part too, but actually, I'm like, oh, Conan's that guy. Like he's a giant now. Like he's 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 transcending in similar ways to the way that Johnny did, the way that Dave uh, did as well. I I I thought, oh, he looks, he's huge. He looks huge now compared to uh, perhaps I mean, the last. He's also time. gained weight. I don't mean physically. Oh yeah, okay, sure. I don't mean physically. Like, like I'm saying, this guy here, he's a giant. He's a giant now. Like he, he, and right. He's, he hosted late night, a late night show for 28 years. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think we're including the year he was on the um, not um, legally prohibited from television tour. Yeah, but still, he was part of the conversation. He got a Twitter account after mocking Twitter, and used that Twitter <laughs> account to parlay a whole new um chapter of his career. Yeah, because I, I love because he loved the confines. He loved the confines of being able to execute. Like there's economy of words, and there's 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 dealing with your stylistic. Like Letterman has a certain style, and mm-hmm. and, and how he did. And one of the things about Dave that's so amazing is that his punchlines aren't necessarily punchlines. It's the way it's the Dave delivery, and 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 it's that's yes. why it's so hard to imitate. Uh, Conan similarly did that with Twitter because he had these confines. And 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 his jokes were unbelievable on Twitter. That that's a great point. That's a, it's a really good point. I don't think we talk about yes. that enough. And I'm one of those people where I like when people are stuck within confines and have to like push against them to get something funny, amusing, groundbreaking, whatever you want to call it, rather than on the internet where it's a free for all. Right like you can do whatever you want and like like I said I'm from New Jersey my parents are from Brooklyn like you cursing a ton doesn't phase me that's not groundbreaking right like we now know what your favorite words are but that doesn't do anything for me yeah I uh I, I I've talked to some of the writers and I've asked that question what do you prefer and I should ask it some more I should actually I should make that a standard question that I ask some of the writers when they come on. What do you prefer? Do you prefer the wide open spaces or do you prefer, you know, the paddock that you have to figure out your best way to kind of uh, that, that you get released from. And then you have a shoot that you, you have to go down in a, in a pathway with that has a fence that you have to play within those confines. Um, late night, certainly late night with David Letterman, I should say certainly had that because they wanted to differentiate it from the tonight show. And yeah. so, yeah. So, uh, but let's go back to Conan. Because yeah, Jay up. was not doing Will It Float. No. Johnny, you mean, Johnny wasn't doing Will It Float. Oh, well, Johnny or Jay, they the weren't or, doing Will yeah. It Float. Yeah, no, 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 that's right. That's right. They wouldn't do things like that. And 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 Late Show, same thing. Um, you know, some of these, some of these, uh, people talk about headlines and how, 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 you know, that was small town news and, and, and the moment that other shows start doing some of these things. That's where Letterman and company want to move and try and find something new. Uh, Conan, same thing. I mean, the creativity that he, he has is, 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 um, is unparalleled. I think, I think you're right. The output that they well, had. Oh, go ahead. Well, he took headlines and small town news and made actual items, which throughout the entire thing, he's like, you can't make this up. And it's like, it's clearly made up, but that's what made late night. So great because it's like, can't make it up or like with the year 2000 yeah. when the year 2000 was like 10 years ago and like that was hilarious i was so disappointed when they moved to the tonight show and made it the year 3000 because i'm like the year 2000 was funnier because like we're predicting the future that was 10 years ago oh and it was and you talk about a long a long joke like a like a, like a joke where you just keep doing the same thing over and over because I remember when the millennium happened and, and, and okay, now what are they going to do with it? <laughs> and they just kept it. Like it, it became, it became a new thing at that point in such a, like it's genius the way that they would right. do that. Um, and, 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 and then what we're talking Conan, about this, go ahead. 
Conan Central Time Zone countdowns for the years were also brilliant. I'm sad that they don't do that anymore <laughs> because it would just be something weird. And then like Max and Conan would either get really drunk or pretend to be really drunk. I'm not really sure what was going on there. <laughs> But it was always entertaining because it was some weird, like, like, was it like Oprah and like someone, like, just giant heads, like, making out or like, it was just weird things like that, which you couldn't do at any other hour. Yeah, I, uh, I, I really, I, I think that uh, I'm glad that Conan is getting, um, the the reverence he does deserve for what he has done and and to me that was evident when he showed back up on the tonight show even though it was only two segments and 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 um you know it it, it was similar in the he was he was treated in my in my opinion the same as 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 any other guest that's plugging something uh you know right. like an a-list like he was treated like an a-list an a-list movie star who was plugging something you know given the two segments of course you know the the uh the band did uh, a special theme for him in this case here, the Conan's NBC theme, which I thought was very, very interesting. Um, that excited that they, me. That did it. Did it get you? Yeah. You, you liked hearing that, did, but you also tipped me off to it before. Oh, you didn't watch. know that. I, I spoiled that for you. I'm sorry about yes, that. You did. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. <laughs> um, but it was, it was cool. To, it was cool to hear that. Um, What did you think about Conan and Jimmy talking to each other on the set of that show? first of all it was very obvious that Conan was doing what a lot of comedians do when they go on a talk show where it's they basically do a stand-up routine sitting down and the host is there just to help them get through it okay I don't know if that's because Jimmy is famously not great at interviews which is why his his show is so game heavy Mm -hmm. but that was what Conan was doing. And then I was reading some of the comments and I don't listen to every Conan O'Brien podcast, Mm -hmm. but people were saying, Oh yeah, he told that story on the podcast. He did. So I was sad that he didn't say something new. I appreciated it because I know like I like his acting out and things like that, but like if he's telling stories he told on the podcast, it's like, it really wasn't that big of a deal. He is any other celebrity promoting something. Yeah, it's the Tonight Show. As he said, he hosted it for 10 minutes. <laughs> but he didn't come back as the host of the Tonight Show. Like, yes, it was kind of promoted like that. But if you actually watch the interview, that was not the purpose of it. The news coverage of it, which we were talking about before, was interesting because I live in the New York metropolitan area. So WNBC, Mm -hmm. NBC New York is my local station. Mm -hmm. And the way they were covering it was like their team Coco. They were saying he was fired. He was ousted. And while some element of that is true, I'm like, he quit pretty much. He told NBC, I'm not doing what you're asking me to. I'm going to choose to leave. Mm -hmm. Um, For him, I mean, it's not one of those like hefty moral questions, but for him, it kind of was when it came to The Tonight Show's legacy. Mm -hmm. So he felt he had no choice to leave. Mm -hmm. It wasn't he actually got fired. Similar to David Letterman, by the way, when he left NBC. Right. There's a pattern. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was interesting that the local NBC station was buying into the narrative that has been established that isn't 100% accurate. Mm -hmm. I think it's easier to process it when it's like, oh yeah, he was fired by NBC because people don't like to deal with nuance. Yep. And this is a very nuanced thing where NBC bears most of the blame for the Conan O'Brien fiasco. But Conan set it in motion. Jay could have stepped aside and started Jay Leno's garage years before, which, you know, like 
everyone was like, just go work on your cars. Create a car show. Everyone will be happy if you do that. <laughs> so, like, yeah, it's NBC's fault, but no one is blameless. I like the way you put that. Uh, Jerry Seinfeld was one of those who who, who publicly came out and talked about that. Uh, Carter mentioned this in um, in War for Late Night, and and I, it's been mentioned in other places too. But but Jerry came out and said like like What are you doing talking about this? I think it's I think it's the fact that it's the reverence for the Tonight Show, which has been a sticking point for so many people coming along, uh, or along the way, I should say. Dave had this reverence for the Tonight Show. You know, it's not the eleven thirty time slot. It's it's the Tonight Show, and and that was really put to the test during Conan's uh, exit, because NBC had come back and said, "Well, if we could still call it the Tonight Show. We're just going to put it on at twelve oh five, and 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 all of that." And and the idea of this reverence for it, and then you got someone like Seinfeld coming along, going, "Hey, look, you're going to be on TV every single night. Just ride it out. You know, Leno's not going to be there forever. He's quite a bit older than you. All these sorts of things. There's two years left on his deal. Whatever." You know, just ride it out, and and uh, you are you you would be in that camp. With, with you know, don't be illusioned by the franchise that is the Tonight Show. Uh, is that is that accurate? As a Conan fan, I, not as a historian, I want to be very clear when I say that. <laughs> I agree with Conan's actions of leaving the Tonight Show because it, in some ways. You watch The Tonight Show after your local news. You yeah. insert Jay Leno in there. The Tonight Show now becomes late night at a half hour earlier. Yeah. So it's NBC messing with a schedule that you, every country has their own variation of it, but it's been established by TV conventions since the beginning. Mm -hmm. And that's why you don't put a talk show in prime time. Yep. People don't expect it there. And then you also have the Jay Leno fans who tend to be an older bunch who are like, great, now I get to go to bed early. <laughs> Which wasn't helping that case. So it's one of those things where I do think Conan was partially, was responsible for knocking down like the domino that made everything else fall. Mm -hmm. But I don't think his decisions after that were wrong. Like he did what he had to do. Yeah. Yeah. And, and in doing so uh, became, some would say, you know, even more pot. Like I remember when the five-year announcement happened and I think it was that year or the year before that he had hosted the Emmys. Like I remember when Conan had yes. this electricity buzz. It was trouble. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. And, and 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 I can certainly remember Dave having that same electricity that just there was there was something there. There's a moment. And 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 with Dave, um, you know, he seized his moment. He left NBC and went and did something bigger. And that five years uh, with Conan, I felt not that the electricity left because I watched Conan like I would watch Dave and Conan. Um, mm -hmm. And, and my, my favorite for me personally, my golden age was Dave Conan Craig. And, and, and the nice thing about okay. being on the West Coast is my letterman shows up, you know, at 830 because I could time shift. Right. And so I would yeah. be the I would watch Letterman every night, my time around nine, 930. I'd have it on the DVR and I would that's when I would watch Letterman. And then I would watch one of the 1230 shows. I would watch either Conan or I would watch Ferguson, um, mm -hmm. you know, kind of real time and then catch the other one later. That was my golden age yeah, for me. Those drew the same type of crowd. I never really got into Craig Ferguson. Yeah. But I do appreciate Jeff. <laughs> so like there are aspects of it I do appreciate, but I was I was a Conan person and that's who I was going to watch. Yeah. Did you like Conan's Tonight Show? No. But I didn't they? There was like too it. much Will Ferrell there. Like, I'm not a Will Ferrell fan. Ah, uh, okay, okay, okay. Um, It was very different. It felt, whereas Letterman grew into that time slot and that yep. type of show, it, with Conan, it felt like they took a lot of things away from him because yeah. they weren't appropriate at an earlier hour. So he lost some of that that made him special. 
when he moved to CB to TBS, he got some of it back. Yep. But again, intellectual property of NBC. Yep. You don't get to take everything. Conan is now on pretty good terms with NBC because all the people who were involved in that fiasco have left. Yep. I also think that the Tonight Show fiasco, the late the war for late night had to happen because if not, we wouldn't have Team Coco. Conan wouldn't have a podcast network that was sold to Sirius for a billion dollars. So Conan came out of this better off than he would had he been the host of The Tonight Show, which would have forced him into a very traditional role, whereas Conan isn't a traditional talk show host. Right. Uh, just like David Letterman in some in some respects as well. Like, again, that's the similarity that they have. Right, but Dave had reverence for Johnny. Yes. Uh, Conan revered Johnny, but I think Dave more, because there's the story where he says he hitched hike to New York and watched the David Letterman show mm -hmm. on the daytime before it was canceled. Mm -hmm. So Conan's base of a talk show was going off of letterman's so of course it, it it was starting from something slightly askew yeah yeah that's a good point uh the emmy nominated uh david letterman show by the way and there's the emmy package that went out to for for one of the emmys for that they were uh they were nominated for after cancellation which is kind of interesting bill shortridge sent us that shout out to bill um jeez I know it's pretty. It's, I love. I love having that. I can't believe the late night that. book. Your worldwide pants jackets. I'm just like, oh, <laughs> like I. I want a worldwide pants jacket so bad. Oh, well, we'll see. Well, oh, it's. I know people who know people. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see what we can perhaps do uh, to make that happen. Um, I could. You that and was I part could... of the reason why I wanted to be an intern. So I'm like <laughs> that jacket. It's like you've done this before. Okay, so I knew what I was going to finish with, um, and I knew it was going to be about the intern, the internship, you applying for that. Uh, we do, I do want to stop this, our first. I love that you and I are connected. I'm so grateful that we did get connected and that we can uh, spend hours and hours and hours talking about this stuff uh, on the phone. This is our first time doing it on camera. Uh, I'm enjoying it very much. I hope you are too. Now, let's I am. talk I about- I love this. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear that, Allison. So let's 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 figure this out because you're you're finding your way in the world, figuring out how you can merge the idea of a career and what you love and what you're now an accredited expert at. You are a, you are a legitimate TV historian that's just figuring out what the next step is. You've done some hey. podcasting. You've done some things where figuring out what uh, you know how how you can um, execute this uh, as best as you possibly can. Right. Where are ways I don't that people think can we find touched you? On Hold on. Yeah. I don't think we touched on my background completely. So I have a, my bachelor's from Rowan in journalism and radio TV film, my master's in business from Rutgers University. Yeah. I did apply to PhD programs, but instead I decided to go back to Rowan and in the fall I'm starting a, an MA in television studies. Okay. So Dr. Lips is still a little bit further down the line. Yes. And that I, is, that is not a stage name. Lips is the last name, and uh, I, I cannot yes. wait for the time that I can call you Doctor Lips. That's gonna be that's yes. gonna be amazing. I still think like if I only went into medicine, I could be like a plastic surgeon, and that would be my <laughs> specialty. And like it just writes itself. It does. It I mean, does. It, my, like like it would be plastic surgeon or porn star. Like those would be my options if yep. I really took the last name as. Like, uh, there's like literally a thing like Sally Ride was an astronaut. Like yeah, yeah. where your last name tells you what you did. I'm a gigantic uh, Los Angeles Kings fan, and the, the 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 year that we won the Stanley Cup, Jonathan Quick was our goaltender. I just I I, I adore that very yeah. very much, you know. Um, okay, so you've got you've you've done some podcasting. You've 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 gone into this world a little bit. What are some of the things that you have done? What are some of the the aspirations you potentially have? Uh, how can people find you? That's another that's another thing too. Is is you're a fascinating to 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 get the perspective of and and again are nothing short of an expert same like like adam needeff um you know when it comes to game shows you are yes. certainly that when it comes to television history and i appreciate that about you what are some ways that people can uh, can find you the recovering digital marketer kind of <laughs> 
I wouldn't say embarrassing because it's setting boundaries, but it's a little odd where you can find me at a Michelle. No, that's my email. I mean, you can email me, but my Twitter account is at Allison M lips, which I don't update that ever unless I have a pop break article yep. going out, which is the com. I recently interviewed Hannah Forcier, who is a lifestyle content creator. Mm -hmm. He's at pop break. I am the digital trends editor. So I follow what goes on online, mm -hmm. which again, I have to choose. So that's why late night takes the back burner. Yep. And like you said, I'm a historian. So I pay attention to what's going on now, but I'm really diving deep into the history and seeing how were people reacting to things at that time and how are they perceived now? Mm -hmm. So what do you want to do? I want to teach at the university, which is why I'm getting a PhD, but there's no money in that. Yeah. I'm aware that's a huge investment, both time and money, and there's no money in that. Yep. What I would love to do is do more like podcasting, writing about television history in a way where it makes it relevant to people who aren't obsessed with this type of stuff. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I've noticed is there is a huge lack of media literacy, especially mm -hmm. in the United States. And with Facebook and Instagram and TikTok, it's a cliche, but the algorithms put you in a bubble and feed you what you want. Yep. Um, so that is why my feed on Facebook is cat photos and videos. <laughs> the all dot letterman group, which predates me. Yep. Literally. Which Literally, yeah, it was former Usenet group, which yep. I knew it was a Usenet group before it shifted to Facebook. Yep. Which, again, one of those like weird things that I know because I got into this at a very young age and mm -hmm. the internet was there and I used it. My dad was a computer programmer. So I was on the computer from the age of three. Mm -hmm. And like as an eight-year-old, I was looking up like jokes on AOL. So child appropriate jokes, some Bob Hope, Milton Berle slip through. <laughs> so that's also an introduction because of all the little things. And I was paying attention. Yep. And I would like to either write a book like Adam Nudef does, um, start a podcast similar to this because I have mm -hmm. done Pop Break Goes to Washington, yeah. which was about political movies and what their impact was and how they are per perceived now with the benefit of hindsight. Yep. Um, I've also done a few guest spots on the Anniversary Brothers podcast. If you're interested in HBO, The Magic School Bus. Was it The Magic School Bus? No, I think we talked about the magic school bus definitely okay wow no it was um bill nye the science guy another oh, previous right show i grew up watching yep match game yep um because late night and game shows and children's television are my three main areas yep. i love sitcoms dramas i'm not as strong but again late night not a hard thing with sitcoms um mary hartman mary hartman's been on my to watch list forever yep I finally got those DVDs. So yeah, you can find me at the pop break. You can find me on Facebook. You can find me on Twitter, LinkedIn. If you want me to write for you, you want to hook up that way. Yep. Find me at LinkedIn, Allison Lips, the one who went to Rowan and Rutgers. That's me. <laughs> so wait, you know. wait, hold on, hold on. There's another Allison Lips. There are multiple Allison Lipses. Well, there you go. All right. There's another uh, one who spells it like me. We have a middle, different middle name. And then there's one with two P's. 
in their last name. Okay. Well, there it is. And, and, uh, um, let's finish off by talking about, you know, you, you, you obsessed with, you, you started with Conan. Conan might've been your gateway drug, but then you shifted over to Letterman, um, in, in, in many respects. It's safe to say that that's the case, right? Say both of them, but yeah, okay. Letterman in many respects. Be and I think part of that was because I discovered Conan when I was 10. Yeah. And then my parents put it on because they were sick of Nickelodeon. And it, the late night with Conan O'Brien show was in many ways very similar to Nickelodeon at that time. Yep. But with more adult jokes, obviously. Sure. So my parents put it on when it was rerunning on Comedy Central because they were sick of me watching Nickelodeon. And they're like, this is Conan O'Brien. She might like it. <laughs> they didn't know I had already been watching him for like six months. On, they were on CNBC. He was on CNBC as well, right? Yes, he was. Yeah. Um, okay. So then you went and you took your shot. And I want to, I just want to ask you about that because I'm fascinated with the interns. Uh, you know, we did our intern summer series last year and the Letterman podcast. I've got a, a few interns lined up that are going to come on the show. You, you went and took your shot. You didn't, you didn't make it, but you miss a hundred percent of the shots. You don't take you at least took your shot. You yeah. tried and you had the interview, right? Talk about your wanting to so become a I Letterman applied, intern. So I applied to be an intern. I made it to the top 50, but they're like, we've decided not to interview you. Try again next year. Yep. But that was between my junior and senior year. So next year would have been a, after I graduated, which they, I knew someone who did that, mm -hmm. but they weren't allowing that anymore. So that meant I had to go apply to the PAGE program, which right. I had friend of a friend got me in I had that interview and I completely bombed it I showed up way too early I am such a fan as you can tell but trying to play it cool it sounded like I had never seen an episode of late night uh, or yeah of the late show before yeah. when in fact I had seen a good chunk of late night years of the late show yeah but there are things when you're applying for a job, you don't tell people. Like I had school projects that I used Letterman as a basis of and things like that, where I'm like, no, that doesn't sound normal. <laughs> so I was just very much like, yeah, I'm a huge Dave fan. And I believe it was Janine was like, so Janice. have you seen the show? Janice, 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 Janice. I'm sorry, yeah. Janice. Yeah, don't be, don't be. I just, yeah. Yeah, Janice, who is like, oh, so have you seen the show live? And I'm like, no, unfortunately, I haven't had the chance to. Um, I think I explained the situation. It was one of those things where it was just never meant to be. Yeah. Um, so like I walked out knowing that knowing like it, this was not this was not good. Like I felt so bad because I felt like I let the person who got me the interview down. Mm -hmm. Um, because try I played me, I played it so cool where I came off as detached. Right. Also, you don't show up like an hour and a half early to an interview. You just don't. Yep. But I was commuting from New Jersey into New York and traffic could be no traffic an hour and a half traffic i've already taken three hours to get into the city yeah well I'll just ask jerry mulligan about that he'll tell you some stories about getting to the, the commute from jersey to the to the show you were also telling me that that day there was a weird mood on the place yeah i like stopped into the hello deli and got a cinnamon bun or a honey bun or something and like rupert seemed like he was having a bad day okay <laughs> And then I went up super early because I didn't know what else to do. And then I'm like sitting and then I see Alan Ted talking to someone. And Alan wasn't having a good day either. A rare bad day for Alan Coulter. Yeah. So I'm just like, okay. <laughs> like, like, I get, like, it was definitely just not meant to be. Yeah. Um, which I'm fine with because I don't know what would have happened. Like that could have completely destroyed my like love for the show. Mm -hmm. Because I, I know the interns work long hours. I, 
the pages got paid like ten dollars an hour at that time Mm -hmm. so half my money would have been going to the bus to get into the city yep um and it was just not just not meant to be i didn't end up working in production i'm more of a writer historian Mm -hmm. my day job is data analysis for an advertising company which again goes back to nielsen yeah i'm one of those people who was very fortunate to have an idea of what they wanted to do when they were younger yep but things took me to like different aspects of it so if you look at my resume you have to like piece together how it makes sense which it does once you talk to me but if you look at it you're like you've done so many different things <laughs> yeah but they all they all feed are pieces to the puzzle that feed like you said the, 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 it captivated me when you told me that your dream job would was good to be at nielsen at the nielsen yeah. uh like like that to me is, is so and so to me yeah so go into marketing like to, to me that makes sense or digital marketing yeah. i should say that that there's a through line there as to how you can somehow some way take a, a kernel of your passion and turn it into something that you can you can you can monetize or whatever um i see i see things for you though just because of your perspective because of your deep knowledge um that, that you have for this stuff and i mean you you have done such a good job today of kind of scratching the surface compared to where your mind can go because you go deep and and i appreciate that about you how deep um and rich you know this stuff and and i'm kind of in awe of it because you have uh, have seen it from not just an academic standpoint uh, but also because you have passion for this stuff at your age, it's it's phenomenal. And I'm really grateful that you're around because, uh, you know, when when some of us older folks are gone, you're going to be the one that's still around remembering this stuff. And 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 um, having you have the same desire that I do, that you want to transfer this knowledge. So I'm, I'm glad that you're walking around on the planet, Allison. And I just I love talking to you. I just I, I love you. our rapport. Me too. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no, this has been a lot of fun. I'll do a really quick outro and then uh, we'll say our goodbye privately if that's okay with you. Yeah. All right. I appreciate that. Um, there we go. And, and you know, I just want to say since this, uh, the Letterman podcast has began, it has been so much fun with the folks who have reached out and love to go deep on this stuff with me. And I mean, there's a whole bunch of you that I, that I, that I've done this with, uh, where, where we just, you know, we'll go off and, 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 and go back and forth on some of this stuff and, and talk about the impact that this has made on our lives. It's, it's a lot of fun. One of the things that we wanted to say unabashedly from the very beginning was we wanted to build a community and it's really cool watching the evolution of that community. Uh, my, my friendship with Allison being one of those, uh, one of those, those things and, and seeing what she's doing, Adam Nita, same thing. I just appreciate the pe- folks out there who are so thoughtful about this stuff and want to also, um, translate this history and, and, and transfer it to other people. It's, it's a lot of fun. Um, the hello, or the Letterman podcast has one sponsor, one sponsor only that is hello dash dot com rupert g may not own the hello deli anymore but hello dash deli.com is still running strong get yourself a late show with david letterman mug get yourself a late show with david letterman hat shirt whatever it is go to hello dash deli.com and uh get you or a family member or a friend a piece of uh late show with david letterman merchandise this has been another episode of the letterman podcast with mike chisholm coincidentally i am mike chisholm thank you and good night